Having looked at an overview of other assignments and the different levels of assurance that we can give, what we need to do now is look at some of these specific things that you could be asked to do on the course. There are a number of other assignment types that could come up. Some of them come up rather more than others, so let's have a look at those and see what we can do with them. We're going to start off by looking at two forms of what is called a review assignment. The two most common ones that seem to come up, and they do come up quite a lot, are a review of next year's figures, so a review of forecasts or projections, and taking those two things together, they are known as PFI, Prospective Financial Information. So, what is PFI? Two basic types of information of the future. There are your actual forecasts of what you think is likely to happen in the next six months, year, or maybe even slightly further. And then as well as your forecasts, which are your sort of best guess of what's going to happen, you might also do some projections, where you say what might happen if sales go up by 10%, what might happen if sales go down by 10%, and look at different scenarios that could occur. Now, it would seem fairly unlikely for you to be given some projections to check, because the very nature of projections is they are what-if scenarios so what if sales goes up by this percentage? What if by that percentage? So there's different bits of assumptions, and you're, you're not really saying any of these will definitely happen. You're just trying to look at what might happen if they did. So to talk about the figures being accurate doesn't really make much sense. As long as all the correct numbers have been put in the projections, the whole point is they're not meant to be accurate. They're what if scenarios. But forecasts, on the other hand, they are a company's best estimate of what they think is likely to happen in the next, say, 12 months. Now, that's one example. Uh, and the other uh, popular example on the exam of reviews is due diligence. Now, due diligence in the English language can mean a number of things, but as far as this course is concerned, it's most likely to mean company X is taking over company Y, or maybe merging with company Y, and before they do this, they want to check out this other company. Make sure that what they think they're acquiring is what they're actually acquiring. So let's consider these two things then. Firstly, forecasts. Why is it that if I'm given a company's forecast for next year, I'm likely to do a review, not a full audit? Well, the main reason is remarkably straightforward. How can you check if next year's numbers are right when they've not even happened yet? They're guesses, they're estimates. All we can really do is check that they look reasonable, or maybe that they don't look unreasonable, sort of negative assurance type of idea. So if I'm reviewing forecasts, what might I do? Well, we know that a review is based around two main types of audit test, analytical and inquiry. So let's first think analytical. What might I compare with what? Well, I suppose if I've been given next year's forecasts, the most obvious thing to compare them with is the most recent set of numbers from the past. The current year. 
Do bear in mind that if I'm looking into next year and comparing that with the current year, that presumably means the current year hasn't finished yet, so the figures I'm looking at are not audited. So what I might want to do is compare next year, both with the current year figures I can see, although they're probably not audited yet, and maybe last year's figures, which have been audited. They're more out of date, but on the other hand, at least they've been checked. So that's one thing I could do, to appear, make it look as though those numbers might possibly appear reasonable. Of course, if I'm going to do that, I should bear in mind that what the company plans to do next year might not be the same as what they've been doing this year, and I should factor that in to my considerations. Another thing I could do is to go back 12 months to the previous year's forecasts and see if the previous forecasts turned out to be fairly accurate. Because if I can see that this company is good at forecasting, because they've got it right in the past, that is some evidence that they might be able to get it right in the future. If I'm looking ahead to next year and trying to assess if a set of forecasts looks reasonable, I should also look outside the company at the industry and maybe the economy in a wider sense to see if their forecasts seem to be taking account of what's going on in the world. So far, what I've been doing is comparing the forecasts with something else. Another wise thing to do is to actually compare the numbers within the forecasts. Because if I'm assuming that sales are going to grow during the year, then presumably I should also predict that costs are likely to grow, and receivables are likely to be higher at the year end, and more inventory is likely to be required. So there should be a bit of common sense behind the numbers. Bear in mind, a lot of computer software that does forecasting will allow you to change the projected sales figures and will then alter some of the other figures as well because it assumes that they will loosely, or maybe quite accurately, follow sales. So there's a little bit of analytical stuff that I can do on some forecasts. The other main type of work we do is enquiry. We ask questions. So if I presented you with a set of forecasts for a company for next year, what's the first question you're likely to ask me? I suspect the first question you'll ask is, where did I get these numbers from? How did I create these estimates? 
I may, of course, have just sat down with a blank piece of paper and used a bit of common sense. Or I might have used a detailed computer package, fed in lots of assumptions and done something reasonably clever. And it's useful to know that because in giving your opinion on these forecasts, the more work I've put into producing them, the more likely it is that they are somehow close to being accurate. So, the E is inquiry. How are the numbers produced? And it would also make sense to ask what the assumptions are behind them. Not just the economic assumptions like sales growth, inflation, interest rates, tax rates, but also assumptions on what the company might do. So, for example, if you had a forecast set of profit figures and also a balance sheet for 12 months' time, receivables would appear very low if the directors have assumed that they will be tightening up credit control and making people pay quicker. Now, if they're intending to hire some credit controllers, or they're planning to factor their debts, or maybe they're going to offer lots of discounts for early payment, that would make sense. Now, there are a few examples of analytical and enquiry, but it might be possible to do some slightly more detailed checking as well. Because if I'm checking some forecasts for a period that begins in three or four weeks' time, maybe even a couple of months' time, it may be that some of the things that the company will receive and spend in that time period are already fixed. For example, the company's major expenses may already be fixed because things like Rent might well be part of an existing rent agreement. Many companies know what their rent, their lease payments are going to be well into the future. Salaries may already be decided for next year, especially if you're looking at these forecasts very close to when next year begins. Most people know their salaries before January the 1st. It may also be that some sales are already agreed for next year. People may already have placed orders, maybe even paid deposits. And if it works for sales, maybe it works for purchases as well. Maybe if the company has received orders, it has already placed orders for the items it needs to sell. So if you think about it, checking a set of forecasts might be slightly easier than you first think. Whilst there'll be lots of estimates in there, some of the numbers may already be fixed or there may be other evidence available to help you judge if they look reasonable. So... That's an example of how you might go about doing a review assignment of some forecasts. Let's move on now and take a look at due diligence. With due diligence, company X is taking over company Y and wants to make sure that before it parts with millions and possibly billions of dollars, 
What it's buying is what it thinks it's buying. Now, you might be questioning this and thinking, surely if you're about to part with hundreds of millions of dollars, you wouldn't do a review, you'd want to do an audit, possibly something even more detailed than the normal audit. Well, of course, you'd love to do that. But you've got one or two problems. Problem number one is that until you've actually purchased this, the selling company has control of the information. You're never going to know for sure what you've bought until it's actually in your hands. But a more pressing problem is time. Much as you would love to check this company out in masses of detail, the moment other people hear that you're thinking of buying it, maybe some of your competitors want to buy it too. And that, of course, could drive the price up. So the trick with due diligence is to get in there as quickly as possible, do as much as you can in a short time frame, and then get out again. Well, if you're buying a company, what would you want to check before you part with your cash? Well, you'd want to check that what you're buying is worth the money. So you'd want to look at things like recent performance. Well, if it's currently April and the company you're trying to buy has a December year end, you may well have audited accounts up to last December, so you should be able to trust those numbers. Your problem is you don't know about January, February, March, because it's not audited yet. It's part of the current year. So what you might want to do is some sort of loose audit work on the most recent figures. But you're buying a company not just for its past, but also, of course, and mainly, for what it's going to do in the future. Therefore, due diligence, the second type of review assignment on our list, is surely going to include the first thing on the list. Forecasts. You'd want to look at those as well, wouldn't you? If I'm buying a company, I would also like to check that if it says it owns certain assets, it does own them and they do still exist. I will also want to check out the liabilities. Is there anything hidden I don't know about? Legal cases? and things like that. Now, you might, in buying the company, have a clause in the agreement that any unknown liabilities that arise after you've bought it, but which relate back to things before you bought it, are not your problem. That would make a lot of common sense. Protect yourself. So far, this due diligence review is looking remarkably similar to the concept of an audit, and frankly it is. But it's not just accountancy work that needs to be checked when buying companies. When you buy a company, bear in mind they have employment contracts with their staff, they may have consultancy agreements with freelance staff, and also they're going to have agreements, contracts with customers, suppliers, for their buildings, and it's absolutely crucial that someone with legal experience looks at all of those agreements. Often contracts have got clauses in them that say if the ownership of one of the two parties changes, the other party, if they wish, can cancel the contract. For example, imagine I supply you with goods. Before I supply you with goods, and let you pay on credit, I'll credit check you, because I'm worried you might not pay up. 
But what if the ownership of your company changes? The new owners might have worse credit history, which means I want to check again, and I might now say, cash on delivery, or I don't supply anymore. I'll give you an example of that from my experience. Uh, where I used to live, we had an agreement with our neighbours. Our neighbours had actually put a fence partly on our land because they needed to get some stuff in and out of their back garden that was fairly wide. So they'd moved the fence slightly onto our property. Now they didn't just do this, they came round and asked first and said that because they had to move quite a bit of stuff in and out on a regular basis, would they mind awfully if they left the fence there? And we said, no problem. We knew them very well, we were friends with them, so it wasn't a problem for us and we didn't need that bit of land. But we did say to them, if you ever move house, we'll then move the fence back again. Now that then caused a bit of a problem, because they decided to move house in the future. And when they put the house up for sale, when the estate agent came round and took photos and did all the measurements, of course the estate agent saw the fence over here, and did the measurements and the photos based on that. And we had to be very careful that the estate agent realised that when the new people moved in, we would almost certainly say, that fence gets put back where it should be put. Of course, if we like the new people too, and they have to move stuff in and out, maybe the fence can stay. But it's things like that you need to be very careful of. So there we go, that's due diligence. Not that dissimilar to an audit. And in fact, in the exam, your best tactic probably for something like due diligence and forecasts is to pretend it's an audit, think of all the things you do, and then just tailor it a bit, just alter it to take account of the fact that it's not an audit. But you may find that a lot of the things you'd normally check can still be checked. Now, we're going to move on from... Uh, those two pieces of work, the forecasts and the due diligence, and move on to something that your examiner seems to like quite a lot, and that is forensic investigations. Forensics is where you're doing work which is going to be used as part of a, a legal case, so probably in court. Sometimes, as an accountant, you'll be asked to go and collect some data, some numbers, that will then be presented in court. Sometimes, you'll be asked as an auditor to check some data that's already been prepared by somebody else. As normal, if you are producing the numbers, you are an accountant, in this case a forensic accountant. If you're checking someone else's numbers by gathering evidence to prove if they're accurate, you are a forensic auditor. So what are the issues with forensics? Well, one thing to bear in mind is that if this is going to be used in court, the pressure on you to get it right is much higher. Therefore, your ethics have got to be absolutely perfect. If there are any threats to your objectivity, 
Instead of putting safeguards in place to reduce it, we will almost certainly just have you not doing the work. We've got to avoid ethical threats. Because the work's being used in court, the level of detail may be very high. In fact, potentially, the whole concept of materiality might disappear. Next time you read about a court case and it says, so-and-so is accused of stealing, notice it doesn't say stealing £24,000. It says they're accused of stealing £24,935.61. It's very precise. A third issue is likely to be confidentiality, because you, the person doing the work, may well have to stand up in court and answer questions. And you may be asked questions where you don't really want to give the answer, because you'd be giving company information away. So as you do this work, you'll work in conjunction with your legal advisors, who will tell you exactly what you can and can't say. Because it involves a court case, which could be very high profile, the reputation issues for your firm are also very important. Given there's a court case going on here, it may well be that someone is being accused of something. And if that's the case, you may have to look at why something has taken place and consider all the possible reasons why it might have happened, and then seek evidence to check each of those reasons out. For example, let's imagine that a company thinks they've had some stuff stolen. The reason they think this is their inventory records say they should have this amount, but someone's done a stock take and they've only counted that amount. There's a shortfall. Maybe someone is now being accused of theft. But the thing is, there could be quite a few reasons why the stock records say that and the count says that. It could, of course, be either of those two things which is wrong, or maybe both of them. Stock records would be too high if the company have sold things but not recorded all the sales yet. Because some of these items the books say they have, have actually now left the building. Similarly, if you've purchased things before the year end, potentially the stock records say those items have arrived, but maybe they haven't arrived yet. Or maybe you've purchased things before the year end, and you've recorded the purchase details, the goods received notes, twice. So maybe the book records are wrong. On the other hand, maybe the book records are absolutely correct and you haven't counted properly. You've actually missed some items out. Now, of course, it could be theft. Don't get me wrong. But as the investigator here, a sort of detective, I've got to try and think of all the possibilities and then think what evidence I would need to check each possibility out. If you think it's goods receive notes not being recorded properly, check the goods receive notes. If you think it's sales that have happened but not been recorded, check the goods dispatch notes that are on the system. If you think it might be theft, look at the controls over security. Look at when this problem seems to have happened and did any new staff start at around that point? Maybe that's a clue. So forensics can be very interesting in the real world, but it can also be very high pressure because the people doing the forensic audit work are likely to be the ones standing up in court presenting their evidence, and that's pretty high pressure. In the exam, just make sure you can explain what forensics are, 
But then bear in mind that most of what I've just said looks remarkably like an audit. The difference is being the reason you're doing it. It's no longer for the shareholders, it's for a court case. Your examiner likes forensics. She's already written a couple of articles on it. You'll find those on the ACCA webpage and I strongly make, uh, advise you to go and read them. We've also had a couple of questions already on forensics, so do make sure you go back and work those. The next area we're going to look at is an area which has come up remarkably frequently in the last few years on this exam paper. The nature of this exam question works something like this. Firstly, you're asked to suggest some performance indicators, some targets in other words, that a company should set and then monitor to monitor their performance. You're then asked, as the second part of the question, to suggest the evidence that would exist to help you check the accuracy of those targets once the company has calculated their actual results. The difference, though, is that the targets are not financial targets. This is not profit, sales, market share. It's not those sort of ratios. Instead, the targets are operational, or more likely, social and environmental. The one that's been examined the most is the social and environmental one. And we have an article from the P1 examiner in March 2009. Now the article is by the P1 examiner, so is aimed primarily at P1. But it also has some relevance to this exam. So what we're going to do is just take a look at what if something like this came up. How do you go about suggesting ideas for targets, for KPIs, and what sort of evidence might exist? Okay, let's imagine we have a client, and the client owns leisure centres. So, you know, the sort of place they have swimming pools, gym, squash courts, sauna facilities, and stuff like that. Let's assume that your client has got a number of these leisure centres and a head office. And what they want to do is make sure that the manager of each leisure centre is not just thinking about financial results, but is also thinking about their impact on society and on the environment. Presumably, the logic behind this is that many companies these days seem to have accepted the fact that maybe they have a sort of moral or ethical responsibility not just to be raging capitalists making as much money as possible. Maybe companies should realise that they do create social and environmental impact, much of it typically negative, what you might call the social or environmental footprint, and that if they're creating that footprint, there is some sort of responsibility to try to manage the size of it. Now this has added importance because many companies don't just monitor this data internally, they now put it in their annual report, which means shareholders and other stakeholders are going to be reading it. And if they're going to be reading it, they might question its accuracy, which is why, as an auditor, you might be asked not just to check the financial statements for accuracy, but also to check this social and environmental data. So, your client owns leisure centres. What sort of targets do you suggest they might look at? And once we've suggested some targets, let's then look at the evidence that would back them up.
So what do leisure centres do that has an impact on society? Well, presumably, health and fitness. Now, you might be tempted to suggest things like, does the average member of the leisure centre live longer than the average person who's not a member of the leisure centre? But the problem with anything that specific is you're assuming that the only thing that impacts on someone's life expectancy is whether they go to a gym, and obviously there's a lot of other stuff as well. So maybe the best thing we can measure is just how many members each of the leisure centres has got. Do the members renew their membership? You could even just say the number of classes that you run. But it's not just about the members. It's also about the staff, because giving people jobs and careers is good for society. Not just any old jobs, but some people who work at leisure centres will get qualifications while they're there maybe as a lifeguard or as a fitness instructor. You might also argue that if a company has fairly low staff turnover, that suggests that staff are relatively happy which suggests the quality of their jobs and how they're treated by the company might be fairly high. But leisure centres do other things for society as well. They might, for example, let school children from the local schools have swimming lessons for free, especially if they're during the working day when the leisure centre might be not quite as busy as it is in the evenings and the weekends. So there are a few examples of some of the things that might be used as targets to motivate each leisure centre manager to try to do something that's good for society. Next question. If the company now comes back to you and says, OK, we took your advice, we've collected all this information, how do you know this information is accurate? What evidence could be used to check accuracy? Well, number of members and percentage who renew membership should be fairly easy. Look at the membership records. As to the number of classes that are run, presumably the Leisure Centre has a list of these that it advertises on its website or on some sort of paper form of marketing. The percentage of staff earning qualifications and staff turnover data should be fairly easy to get hold of from the HR or personnel department. And if they are allowing local schools to send school children in to learn to swim for nothing, you don't just let them turn up. Presumably there is some sort of correspondence, written agreement between the leisure centre and the school. So we should be able to inspect that.
Notice how the evidence looks remarkably obvious if you can come up with the targets. And that's the good news about this. The evidence is not that difficult as long as you can think up a few ideas that are to do with social. The good news, of course, is that things like percentage of staff earning qualifications, staff turnover, charitable donations, like letting schools use something for free, things like this can apply to so many different types of company, not just leisure centres. So it's a good thing to practice this for one company because the answers are very transferable to other companies as well. Let's now think environmental measures. Now, leisure centres use electricity and they use water, especially, of course, in the pools, the showers and things like that. And that has an impact on the environment. So, maybe what we should do is measure electricity usage and water usage. The problem with saying that is that whichever leisure centre is the busiest and, of course, may well be the most profitable, is automatically, surely, going to use more electricity and water than all the others. So it seems harsh to penalise them just because they're busy and they're successful. So how about measuring electricity and water usage per member? Because now we're measuring efficiency. And, of course, the evidence for these two is fairly easy, isn't it? How do you know how much water is being used? The water bill. How do you know how much electricity is being used? Hmm, the electricity bill. Of course, one way that a leisure centre might reduce its water usage is when they install shower systems, the showers should be automatic. They only come on if someone stands underneath them. So what we might say is we could motivate leisure centre managers by measuring the percentage of their showers, the percentage of their taps and the percentage of their hand dryers that are automatic. Because the more of those that get installed across the company, the more efficient, the more environmentally friendly we're going to be. With the added benefit, we should save some costs as well. As far as working out whether that information is accurate, I suspect the easiest way to do it is for whoever's checking this data to visit the leisure centres and look. Now I think you get the idea. All sorts of things could be measured here, not just usage, but also pollution. How about the percentage of their waste which is put in recycle bins, compared with the percentage that is not put in recycle bins. All sorts of things you could measure. And the good news is no exam question so far has wanted any more than two or three ideas. And if you can think up the ideas, as we've seen, the evidence is fairly straightforward. I mentioned earlier that we have also had questions looking at operational measures. Well, if I said your company runs trains and you've been asked to look at operational performance measures, 
Surely with trains it's things like whether they leave on time, whether they arrive on time, how full they are, the number of accidents, all of which are pretty easy ideas to come up with and again are very transferable from company to company. Let's face it, most operational measures for a train company would be pretty much the same for a bus company, an airline, maybe even a training company. Because a training company is worried about how many people are in each class, how full they are. Did the class start on time? Did it finish on time? What are the pass rates like? So these questions should not present you with too much trouble as long as you're prepared in the exam not just to sit there and think, where have I seen this before? Did I do another question on this? But just sit back, think real world, relax. It's common sense. Now, with this part of the course, potentially there are all sorts of things that the examiner could ask you. Accountants are asked to do more and more variety of interesting assignments on a day-by-day -day basis. So the key is, practice the ones we've gone through because those come up quite a lot, but just be willing to accept that she might ask you something, a piece of work you've never seen before. She won't ask you anything too silly, so if it looks a bit different, bear in mind no one else has seen it before either. Relax. Think if you were asked to do this, how would you do it? Well, that's it on the non-audit assignments. Virtually guaranteed that something from here will be on the exam, typically as a big chunk of question number two, maybe question number one, so a compulsory question. Don't let it put you off. A little bit of practice and you'll soon realise that the questions on this have been very repetitive over the years.